Hi, everybody. I'm Logan. And I represent group A2. You're out there? Yeah. And I'm coming from Halifax Area High School. And I'm introducing Mike Fleck. He is a state representative of the 81st District, District of Center hum Huntington and Mifflin counties. He grew up in Southern Hemington County, and he has a brother and two sisters. He always loved politics, and he grew up loving it, and he, when he was 10 years old, he used to always read the paper to his grandfather, and he's, he loved it ever since. Um, in high school, he was the senior class treasurer, and after college, he was on the school board. This is now his fourth term in an eight, an eighth year in office, and he was 32 when he started. Now here's the Honorable Mike Black. And here is your pin for pinning. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Well, welcome to the Pennsylvania General Assembly. I, uh, it's a rarity to see such well-behaved people sitting out there, because if you've been here before, usually the, the House chamber looks like the New York Stock Exchange. You have people running around, you can barely hear. Later in the evening when I watch it on PCN, it's like, oh, I didn't hear that person say that. Uh, first of all, if you want to re-watch re the speech, it's going to be live streaming on my website as we speak now, uh, which is... Uh, repfleck.com, and there will also be a copy on there later. Uh, I already introduced myself to the Mike Fleck imposter down there. Wave your hand. <laughs> That's my seat. Uh, I, I feel like I have a great seat here in the House Chamber. I also know that there are two of my constituents here, one from Huntington High School and one from Juniata Valley. Let me see your hands. Okay, there's one. Oh, perfect. I, I want to catch up with you guys later. This is my eighth term, or eighth year in office, uh, fourth term. Uh, there are two-year terms. There are 203 members in the Pennsylvania General Assembly. And as you know, Pennsylvania is an incredibly diverse state. We are one of the most populous states in the country, always have been, used to be the most populous. I think now we're down to sixth. Uh, we have, of course, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh with a whole lot of ruralness in the middle. We also have some of the best uh, medium-sized cities in the country. Uh, and that diversity all converges here. And of 203 members, you need 102 votes to pass anything. And so that's where the real leadership uh, takes place. I have the ninth largest district out of 203 because it's so rural. Every 10 years when we do the census, they redraw the lines and uh, uh, they uh, you know, try and get the same amount of people. Uh, constitutionally, we have to have the same uh, amount of people in each district, plus or minus 1%. Of course, that changes uh, in a matter of minutes as people are being born and people are dying. Right now, the 81st district has uh, 64,400 and some odd number. Uh, so that's, that's about the size of uh, the, the districts. And we're average for what we uh, represent. A lot of people will say, oh, you have one of the largest assemblies. We are a large state. So, uh, you know, we're right in there in that middle tier with the number of constituents that, that we represent. There's also 50 senators. And, uh, you know, you can do the math of the 12 million plus uh, people. Leadership is something that I learned from my parents and grandparents, uh, mainly community service and to get involved early in life. Uh, my mother was active in a local nursing home. We were active in our church. Um, Logan introduced me and, and had mentioned about my grandfather. That's really where the love of politics uh, developed uh, for me. Uh, my grandmother died in 1982, and my grandfather uh, lived for another 10 years he loved politics. He was active on the Republican uh, County Commi Committee for some 50 years. And so after she died, his eyesight was really bad, so he lived a mile up the road. I would ride my bike up. We shared a newspaper. We were too cheap to have two subscriptions. And he, the only thing he wanted to hear about were the obituaries and anything political. And at that time, in the early uh, 1980s, we had some interesting local politicians. 
State Senator Robert Jubilier, who had just been elected uh, the President Pro Tem of the Senate, which is the highest uh, position in the Senate. We had my predecessor once removed, Sam Hayes, who had just been elected Majority Leader. Uh, and these guys were in the paper constantly. So I was always excited when, you know, through my grandfather, they would come around asking for his support, and I always thought that was neat. Uh, later on, uh, as, as Logan mentioned, my first elected position was treasurer of my senior class. And uh, before long, right out of college at 27, I ran for the school board and served for five years until I was elected uh, here at 32 and was one of the youngest members at that time. Uh, I think I was the eighth youngest. Uh, the average age, I think, is somewhere in the mid-40s, which I'm rapidly approaching. Um, but uh, it, it's excited to see so many young leaders. You guys are the future, and you're already leaders. And so it's great to see you here today. I hope that you will, I know you'll take what you learn from this great program and will apply it in life, whether it's in business or industry. Uh, you have to be flexible in today's market of where you want to go. I know I had clear-cut ideas of what I wanted to do uh, starting in college, changed my major right off the bat, started out pre-med and then went to history and thought, yeah, I want to be a history professor. And after uh, spending a couple years in graduate school and realizing that history professors uh, were a dime a dozen, and the only way that I was going to get a job was win a Pulitzer Prize or something else. Uh, so um, I ended up uh, 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 continuing working for the Boy Scouts as a district executive and uh, getting into politics. So I had, I had three passions or three goals in life. One was be a history professor, spend the summer writing, and then eventually run for office. So I did the run for office thing first. I still love to write. And uh, one of these days when I'm out of office, I still uh, anticipate going back for my PhD and uh, maybe I can get a job in that field at this time. So um, at this time, I want to open the floor to questions because I know we're on a tight schedule and we have uh, probably about 10 minutes here. So who has the first question? Oh, I did such an amazing job, answered all your questions. You can think of something. This is the nicest capital out of all 50 states. Uh, it was uh, built at the end of the Gilded Age when Pennsylvania was the, the, one of the most prominent states uh, in the United States. If you look back at our history at that time, uh, we had one-fifth of the world's, not the United States, one-fifth of the world's natural resources whether it was coal in western Pennsylvania and the northern tier, timber, gas, first oil well, uh, it, it all started here in Pennsylvania and we have a proud legacy and that's why when we built a capital at that time they wanted to build something significant of Pennsylvania's standing in the world and certainly it's a great place to work. I, I'm told that there's more marble and granite in this building than any other uh, public building in the, in the northern hemisphere. So, so enjoy your time here today. And we have a question. Thank you. Um, what do you find um, is the most important uh, thing to your constituents currently? Well, all politics is local. So, and nothing's more local than your pocketbook. So probably the biggest thing that I hear from uh, my constituents is property taxes, uh, or we have a pension crisis right now uh, in Pennsylvania. So certainly those are two of the biggest things. And then also with that is just the uh, jobs and economy. Uh, my largest employer is corrections. We have two state uh, correctional institutions uh, in my area. The largest industry is agriculture, and it's it's, a unique situation because a lot of the people in agriculture, the farmers and stuff, they also have their spouse or someone who is working at the, one of the prisons or is a teacher and is getting state benefits. Uh, I recently saw a map of the impact of retirees on the local economy and most of the state employees in Pennsylvania are right here in, in Harrisburg. If you're a state agency, official state agency, you have to be domiciled here within the city limits. So the impact in Dauphin County, which is the county we're in, and Cumberland County right across the river uh, from, from uh, pension payouts 
is in the hundreds of millions. The next biggest county is Center County at 140 million uh, that has uh, uh, the pension impact, and that's because Penn State is one of our largest employers in the country. Huntington County, the impact from the pension situation uh, of, of retirees and their income is, is th some $30 uh, million. You compare that to surrounding counties like Mifflin, it, it comes down to like 10 million. So that's probably the biggest thing I hear about is the pension benefits. Property tax is a big, a really big deal. Uh, as they continue to go up, they never go down. Uh, we have a bill that would eliminate property taxes. So the problem is, is that it, the most recent vote, uh, it, it only had 59 votes. And you need 102 here in, in the House and the Senate, you need 26. So it, it does become a big issue. Property taxes bring in billions of dollars. So if we uh, switch over to a sales tax, an increase in sales tax, right now we have 70 plus exemptions. Whether it's funeral cost, uh, attorney fees, CPA fees, uh, there's a lot of exemptions. So when you start looking at uh, what you can vote for and what people are lobbying you for, you'll have uh, you know the funeral directors, they'll bring in uh, a, a widow lady who barely has two cents, who just buried her husband and she can't afford to pay anymore, and rightfully so. So you'll get enough votes to remove uh, funeral costs. And before long, you've reduced all those exemptions down to uh, you know, maybe even half. So now a small increase in the sales tax becomes a bigger increase, and then people are, are like, well, you know, why does Walmart uh, get a free ride? They're, they're a business. They should have to pay. And then you get into the argument of how big is a big business versus a small business. And so those are some of the struggles that you have trying to get to uh, 102 votes. So I could go on for a while with that, but we have another question. I was curious as to why you decided to run for representative instead of being a senator. Well, I love, one, they pay the, the same amount, and my district is much smaller. How's that? Now, uh, I, I love just being in the um, front lines, getting to know my constituents. It makes it a lot easier as a state rep. Again, I have three counties, and that's triple the invitations that I, that I uh, have for, you know, it's three uh, large chamber of commerces, that's three realtors groups, that's three sets of county commissioners to deal with. My district is uh, twice the size of 180 of the other 203 seats. So it's, it's a large territory. But I also love the diversity in that group. I love the small town uh, atmosphere, and that's, that's just, you know, what I like to, to, to work in. So, you know, being senator is great, but you have a much larger territory. Uh, it doesn't allow you to be uh, in the communities as much. Uh, you know, there's, there's multiple things during the, the evenings and weekends that, uh, that you would be missing as well. So, next question. I was just wondering, since you represent my school district, um, what are you doing for the schools in your district? Sounds good. Well, Juniata Valley is upwards of 70% funded uh, gets their funding from the state. That's that's pretty big deal. So even a small percentage of a cut in state funding uh, has has a ripple effect throughout our rural school districts, and not just Juniata Valley, but the majority of my school districts, so Southern Huntington, Mount Union, uh, because it's an agrarian base. We don't have a lot of the tax uh, base there that we can uh, uh, work with. So it's it's a pretty big deal. Uh, we have. Um, a couple proposals out there as far as a new funding formula to look at how that affects. Right now we have what's called hold harmless, so you can't get less So than what you would pre a school district cannot get less. I think the uh, education situation has affected us more in rural areas because we have been more frugal and we have made a, a dollar stretch into two dollars and so when you know, people were having to cut, we were already at the bare bones of what we could cut. So it's, it's a tough situation. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about, I was wondering how you went about starting your political career and getting support after just starting and being elected right away. Yes. Uh, well, I was on the school board for five years. 
and that was great experience. I also worked for the Boy Scouts for almost six years, and that put me in every little town, nook and cranny within my district. And so when I first ran, I had really good name recognition. Uh, people knew who I was. And working with the Boy Scouts, I, uh, a third of the job was fundraising, another third was public relations. And so that gave me the ability to raise money because uh, I knew who would give me money when I was running and who was pulling my leg as I learned with the Boy Scouts. So, oh, I got a big check for you and you get like a $25 check, uh, which is great, but you know, you're counting on that 500 to 1,000. Uh, sadly, to run for these positions, uh, you know, you get into the southeast, you know, some of my colleagues are spending $400,000 uh, to run for a position that pays, you know, $85,000. Uh, you know, I'm in a campaign where I just topped $100,000 uh, that I spent, and it, it spreads over a couple media markets. So, so you know, statistically, uh, you know, if all things were equal, which we wish they, they, they were running for office, it's 70% uh, of the people who win are the people who knocked on the most doors. Another uh, upwards of 70% is the person who spent the most money. You have to get your name out there. You have to let people know what you're doing. Uh, politically, once I started here, is one of the things that I've done uh, well, or I at least think well, has uh, been able to work with all sorts of different, different people. Uh, you know, there, everyone here is a leader uh, in the assembly, and I don't vote for them. I vote for some of our leadership people, but, you know, it's like they're not going to lose my vote back home. So, you know, to win them over, to find 101, other two, uh, 101 of the 102 votes that I need uh, to, to pass legislation, you really have to uh, grab the bull by the horns and let people know what your district is about, get them back to your district, and more importantly, go to their district and visit and see what's happening. Because what's happening in Philadelphia is, is a whole other world in central Pennsylvania. Same within Pittsburgh. So it's, it's, it's the same in, in, in life. It's just those networking, the relationships that you make, uh, the time and effort that you put into it. And it all comes down to communication, too. Uh, you know, so many times we, we get thousands of co-sponsors for bills uh, on any given session uh, term. And we'll get a paragraph of what this bill does. And it's like, oh, this sounds good. I'm going to sign on to that. That's what I did my freshman year. Uh, then you find out that, you know, the bill in its entirety is now 80 pages, and it's something horrific that actually hurts your district. Uh, so you really have to have those core groups back home. I try and meet with all my superintendents. I try and meet with business and industry leaders. Uh, and, and all the other stakeholders just to see, okay, hey, this bill's been proposed, what does this mean for you? And so it, it really comes down to networking, getting involved, gaining people's respect and trust, and uh, hard work. Thank you. Okay, they told me this is the last question. Uh, good morning, Congressman. I was curious as to what you believed your biggest accomplishment was in regards to getting legislators legislative bills through this, and what leadership qualities you needed to do that? It, it, the same with the, the last question. You really have to work with people. Uh, you know, I, I've put up uh, some votes that aided the city of Philadelphia, had nothing to do with, with my constituents. But, uh, you know, it's, it's the friends of mine had come to me for, uh, you know, help and just trying to get to their 102 votes. And so, uh, you know, when I had something that really didn't affect them and trying to let them know, hey, I need your help on this. And even though it doesn't do anything for you, we need this. Uh, probably the, the biggest thing was um, the administration uh, wanted to outsource jobs at corrections, which would have cost us a lot of jobs. Uh, in, in the two facilities, uh, as well as there's surrounding counties that have facilities, Center County and um, uh, Clearfield uh, had Healthsdale and, and, and what have you. So that was, that was a pretty big deal. We did a lot of research on that um, and had to, you know, convince people that this was a, a bad thing, that the turnover by outsourcing uh, was going to cost us more money in the long run and that uh, it wasn't going to benefit anyone, and it jeopardized the, the health and safety of uh, our correction officers. You know, one of the other things is, is we do have a large government bureaucracy here, 
And so there's a lot of places when the economy tanked and we had to come up with other uh, sources of money or cut programming, uh, you know, one of the things that I uh, sought out to do is like, okay, what can we do? What can we merge into two departments? So I had a bill that merged the Securities Commission into the Department of Banking. And it's something that the Department and Commission wanted to do, and that's already saved over a million dollars uh, in, in that. Um, also, uh, we had a large growth spurt uh, in the late 80s and 90s with some of our staff and office personnel. And you know, collectively, we now have less staff uh, and less offices than what we did. So that's money that's saved that's been able to put back into our school districts and, and, and what have you. But it, it really takes working together and convincing people that you know, you're on to something here. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, enjoy your uh, time here today. It was great meeting you all, and uh, I'm excited for your future. And uh, I hope that uh, next time I see some of you, you'll, you'll have honorable in front of your name here, and uh, you'll be a colleague, uh, providing I'm still here, or you'll be uh, helping to change Pennsylvania for the better. Best of luck in your future. Uh, this is a great program, and uh, I, I hope that uh, you take out of it uh, I hope you put into it what you can take out of it. Thank you. So we're going to give him a pin for pinning and a program for perusing. And hey, Hobie, what do we think of our speaker? Outstanding. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you. Put this on right now. Thank you.